Hi class, welcome back to Electromagnetics. Um, this lecture we're going to uh, take a quick review of surface integrals. We're also going to uh, look at how we uh, can apply these, at least in one way, to uh, electromagnetics and um, you know, set up and get the tools we need to move forward with Maxwell's equations. First, let's do our historical background. Um, this, for this uh, gentleman, his education uh, was University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Uh, he worked at uh, the University of Cambridge in England, also Trinity College, Marischal College, King's College in London. So, uh, did better work, bit of work in academia. Here's the image of this person. You might actually uh, recognize this one. This is a pretty uh, common known individual. And his name is John Clerk Maxwell. Lived from 1831 to 1879. Uh, some notable things. Uh, first, uh, he was the first to discover the relationship between the equations and the electromagnetic waves known as Maxwell's equations. So he didn't derive these equations but he was the first to see the big picture and put them all together and understand that this, uh, these were the fundamental relationships that define uh, electromagnetics. Uh, he was also a major contributor to the study of color and optics, and actually uh, much of the work he did is uh, still used today in photography. Uh, one interesting note is Maxwell was not his birth name. Uh, he was actually born uh, John Clerk, uh, but when he was an infant, uh, he inherited uh, an estate that I believe was on his mother's side, which was Maxwell. So um, I guess it, in conjunction with that, he took on the last name of Maxwell as well. So uh, if that hadn't happened, these very well could be clerk's equations instead of Maxwell's equations. So uh, just an interesting side note. One quote by, that uh, is attributed to John Maxwell that I really appreciate <clears throat> is, he said, I have the capacity of being more wicked than any example that man could set me. And if I escape, it is only by God's grace helping me to get rid of myself, partially in science, more completely in society, but not perfectly except by committing myself to God. So he was a very devout Presbyterian, became an uh, elder in the church and later in his life. And I don't know about you, I can definitely relate to this and I felt this way at times too. And so it was, it was kind of comforting to me to know that uh, you know, he, he shared some of my feelings, but still um, you know, looked to God and his commitment to God as the answer to that. <clears throat> so again, we're in part two. Continuing down this path, uh, we talked about the line integral last time, so we're going to do the surface integral this time, and then uh, after that we'll uh, start to look at Maxwell's equations. So let's set up this idea of a surface integral. Uh, we want to consider uh, we have a region that has a magnetic field uh, present, and so we want to look at an infinitesimal, infinitesimal small uh, surface at a point in that region is shown below. And so we want to pick this point to, to the point where we can assume that the size of the area is such that uh, the magnetic field uh, is constant over that area. So, you know, for any of those little squares, the magnetic field should be the same. And so you can see here, we just assume some arbitrary angle here. And so if this uh, vector here is our surface vector, so it will be normal to the surface. And so this angle here we're showing between these two is the, you know, the angle between the surface vector and the magnetic uh, field vector. So this would uh, tell us then that if the magnetic flux density vector uh, B is normal to the surface, as we see here in A, uh, then the resultant vector of the magnetic flux and the surface vector uh, would just be the product of the two, just like in the dot product. Uh, if it's parallel, then it would be zero. We should not uh, experience any effect from that magnetic field. 
And if it's at some arbitrary angle, like here, like we showed on the previous slide, <clears throat> uh, then the product would be uh, the magnitude of the magnetic field times the cosine of this angle would get that projection on there uh, with the uh, area itself. So now by my multiplying the magnetic flux density by the associated area, this gives us a new term that we want to talk about called the total flux uh, over the subdivided piece of area delta S. Now this can be expressed as this. So this uh, psi character here, uh, this is what represents total flux. And so this makes sense, right? Because if uh, B is the magnetic flux density, that means we have uh, flux over some unit area if we multiply by the area, then that should just give us flux, the total flux. And so here you can see we have it for each of the subdivided little squares. Uh, just as we said, the, the magnitude of the magnetic field times the cosine of the alpha between them and the area vector. So if we now do this for all the sub areas and add them together, uh, we then have an expression for the total flux over the entire area. And of course, this would look like this, where we're just, you know, we have n number of little areas. So we do that calculation for each and add them up and it's equal to the total flux over the area. Of course, we can plug back in our definition for the flux, how we find it uh, for each uh, subscript. And uh, we can use some mathematical notation then to show this as a sum, summation. So we have the sum of all these products from the jth equal one term to the j equal n term. Uh, and finally, since this is in the form of a dot product, uh, the cosine between the two, uh, we can rewrite this in vector form, uh, showing that um, it's just the dot product between the magnetic uh, field density and the area vector itself. And so. This is, of course, taking into account that this delta Sj is just the magnitude of the delta S or the, the incremental area times that vector showing the direction normal to it. Now, if we continue to divide the subarea into smaller and smaller areas <clears throat> that are infinitesimally small, until the number of areas approaches infinity, our accuracy will continue to improve until we reach the state that we can express this relationship in integral form. So again, this is just the same ideas that we use in calculus. So if we do that, then we sh can show that uh, the total flux over the surface area is the integral over the surface of the magnetic uh, flux density uh, dotted with the uh, incremental surface area. So just integrated over the entire surface. So the integral on the right side of this equation uh, is known as the surface integral of B over S, or we should say of the magnetic flux density over the area. Uh, again, we need to take in mind that since this is integrating over a surface, it should be a double integral. So you'll have you know, an X and a Y or you know, Y and Z or whatever your area is, you're gonna be integrating over an area. So when the surface under consideration is a closed surface, that is it creates a volume, all sides of a volume, uh, the surface integral then is written with a circle associated with the integral sign uh, just like this. So if you see this little circle with an S, before we had the little circle with a C and that meant over a closed path, right? So now this little circle over with an S means it's over a closed surface. So it should be you're integrating over the outside of a volume. <clears throat> uh, this is how we would notate that. So the surface integral of the magnetic flux uh, over a closed surface S is simply the magnetic flux emanating from the volume bounded by the surface. And so the thing you need to keep in mind with that is, is you will have some flux going into the surface and probably some flux going out of the surface. So uh, it'll be the net result of that. So it could be that there's flux going through the surface, but if you integrate it over all surfaces, this integral might come up zero if, uh, uh, you know, if, you, if the part entering is the same as the part exiting.
So just as before, I did want to recall a quick theorem from calculus. And again, this is another uh, transformation of variables um, theorem. So if we have a surface G um, uh, given by Z equal F of X, uh, where X and Y are in R, if F has a continuous first order partial derivative and G X, Y, Z, is equal to gx f of xy, remember f of xy is z, uh, and it's continuous on r, then we can do this little transformation thing here. So again, if we have z defined in terms of x and y, uh, this integral here, we can transform it by transformation of variables into uh, the integral over this continuous r of gxy, and instead of the z term, we have the uh, f of x and y, and then we do it times uh, the secant of gamma. Well, we can rewrite that. If you want to go back to your calculus book, it'll explain why and what this means. <laughs> but I uh, just take my word for it at this point. Uh, secant y, we can replace with the square root of uh, fx squared plus fy squared plus 1. So those are the uh, first derivatives. So with that in mind, let's look at some examples. So they're asking us to evaluate uh, this integral here uh, over some surface G. It's the function xy plus z over ds, where g is the part of the plane 2x minus y plus z equals 3. Um, so uh, drawing the, out the, uh, the boundaries here of R. So in this case, we can solve for z. So if we solve this expression for z, z will be equal to 3 plus y minus 2x. So here we have that situation we just talked about where z can be expressed in terms of x and y. So that's why we're calling this our function of x and y. So fx, which is the first derivative of this, would just be negative 2. fy, which is the first derivative with respect to y, is 1. And now gxz is equal to... Uh, xy plus 3 plus y minus 2x. Okay, so now we can rewrite this then uh, as the original integral is going to be the integral from 0 to 1 and then 0 to x uh, because we had that, uh, uh, that slant, right? So your y is going from 0 to x of xy plus 3 plus y minus 2x, which was where our, our re- uh, defined g, and then our uh, change of variables uh, coefficient out here. And so now if we uh, simplify terms and get this down, it's just a simple uh, integral. We integrate by parts and plug in the values, and we should come up with 9 times the square root of 6 over 8. So you might want to work through that and make sure that makes sense to you. Uh, another example, we're going to consider a magnetic field uh, density. It's defined here as 3xy squared, and it's all in the z direction. So uh, everything's going in the z direction. And I want to determine the magnetic flux crossing the portion of the xy plane uh, lying between x equals 0 and 1 and y equals 0 and 1. So just a square on the xy plane there. So we're going to work this a couple of different ways. <sighs> So for convenience, we're going to divide, divide the surface into 25 equal areas here. And so we'll designate them each by uh, where they are, with the first number being uh, the x number and the second number being the y number. So this is 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1. This will be 1, 2, 2, 2, uh, 3, 2, so on and so forth. So you get to 5, 5, which is the fifth one on each side there. And so you can see then that... Um, the distance to the middle of each of these would be 0.1 and 0.1. So if this is one total, uh, we're looking at 0.2 all the way across for each one of these. Hopefully that makes sense. Oh, also, <coughs> also we have our uh, B term here. So our X, uh, as our X goes, it's going to be 2J uh, minus 1, which is what this is showing us here times 0.1, so each step is going to be that until we get all the way out. Same thing with the y term, 2j minus 1, again, times 0.1, so that's where we get this 0.001. We multiply 0.1 times 0.1. Uh, 
Uh, 3 is from the original equation, so we just plug in our value for x, our value for y, and so this is our definition of the ijth uh, term for the uh, flux density. So we'll use this in just a minute. Okay, so uh, continuing on, since we divided the surface into equal areas, and since all areas are in the xy plane, then our delta s, or our incremental areas, are all going to be 0.04. So that we get that because, remember, we said this is 0.2 and this is 0.2, since we divided 1 by 5 equally. So when you multiply 0.2 times 0.2, you get 0.04, and it's all in the az direction. So it's all going straight up normal to this plane. So we got everything we need then, right? So our total flux then across the surface, we sum up. Um, all the magnetic flux density uh, vectors dotted with all the area vectors. So when we plug this in uh, from before, we know that our area vectors, the delta S is remember 0.04 AZ, and then our flux from the previous slide was 3 times XY squared, so the 3 times X, we said X was incrementing this way, and the Ys were in incrementing this way, and they're squared because it's squared up here. So when we dot this with an AZ with times that with AZ, uh, that just equals 1. So all this falls out. We can move the multiply the constants out front. And we're left with uh, these terms here. So as we just cycle through all the possible uh, combinations, multiply them, add them up, and then multiply them, uh, we get 0.495 Weber. So that's how much flux, total flux, is going through that this uh, overall square. Of course, as before, we could just integrate it and get the exact answer. <clears throat> so if we do this, uh, we, again, our ds, we can find that. It's just the increment dx and dy, uh, az. Uh, so if we come and, and evaluate this dot product, b dot ds, we have our 3xy squared az, which we were given, dotted with dx dy az, az dotted with az, checks out, that gives us 1. So we're just left with 3xy squared dx dy. So now if we take that and just integrate that over the surface, which remember x went from 0 to 1, <clears throat> y went from 0 to 1, uh, integrate that out, we come up with 0.5 Weber. And so that's actually pretty close. Remember when we did it uh, with the dividing up into 5 by 5 sections, we got 0.495 Weber. So if you were to continue to cut those uh, subsections down, of course, it would continue to approach this 0.5 value. So here we want to do a uh, closed surface integral. So we're going to consider this, this vector field here. Uh, we're not told what kind of vector field it is. We could assume it's magnetic field. Um, uh, so it's defined. It has an x component, a y component, and a z component. You can see there. And so the surface we want to integrate over is just x going from 0 to 1, y going from 0 to 1, z going from 0 to 1. So it creates this uh, cube uh, function here. So this field is probably going in and out of this area. So we want to uh, integrate it over the surface to see what the total field emanating out of that uh, box area is. So just as we did with the line integral, the easiest thing to do here, since we have six uh, separate sides, is to break this integral up into six separate integrals and add them together. So we've got uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, A, E, H, D, B, F, G, C, A, F, B, and D, H, G, C surfaces. And that's defined by the points here. So we can just, just simply evaluate each one of these integrals and then add them up at the end. So let's take a look at that. So the first one we want to look at is the A, B, C, D. So that's uh, this box back here. It's on the on the back side of this uh, uh, cube. <clears throat> and so being that this is the back side of the box, the surface uh, vector is actually going to be pointing away uh, back into the back of the page. And so that's why you see here um, DS is going to be DY and DZ or what's changing, right? But the negative sign is because it's emanating out of the box. We want to know, define the surface as pointing out of the box. And so we already had our A vector here. And so when we evaluate A dot DS, since we only have an AX term here, 
the only turn uh, from the uh, vector field that will have any effect on us at all is this 2ax. And so when we dot that, we get negative 2 uh, dy dz. So now we just simply integrate that over uh, z and y. z goes from 0 to 1, y goes from 0 to 1, negative 2 dy dz, and we get negative 2. So now if we do the EFGH, so EFGH, so that's this front side, uh, it's the same dy dz, except this time it's positive because that vector, surface vector is pointing out. Of the, and so it's in the positive direction, both for uh, y and z. So again, we do the same thing. Uh, only the ax term uh, is going to affect us. And so uh, in this case, um, uh, z, uh, excuse me, x is equal to 1. Right, so uh, because of that, it changes our uh, a vector a little bit. So we do this dot product and multiply it out. And so we get 3 dy dz. Again, integrate this from 0 to 1, and we get 3. Same thing for a, e, h, d. So a, uh, e, h, d. So again, this is pointing, the surface vector is pointing this way, so it's in the negative direction. With y equals 0, this uh, changes our definition of y just a little bit. We do this dot product, same as we did before. Uh, this time it's the y term. So you'll dot this ay with that ay. The other two will be 0 because they're perpendicular. Get minus dz dx. Again, integrating from 0 to 1 over that surface in terms of x and z. And we get negative 1. So that's three other surfaces. Continuing on, if we look at the BFGC, so that's uh, BFGC, so that's the surface here. Uh, it's pointing in the positive, it's on the outside of it, so it's pointing in the positive uh, y direction. So we'll have dz dx and then a positive ay unit vector. y is equal to 1, or all the other variables are changing. So we'll put that into our uh, a definition of a, and when we do, of course, it changes it a little bit. And when we dot this, our, only our a, y terms will have any contribution. The x and the z don't. So when we dot that, we get negative 2 dz dx. Again, integrate in terms of uh, x and z from 0 to 1, and we get negative 2. Uh, hopefully you're catching on to this now, so I'll keep, just speed it up a little bit. A, e, f, b. So we got a, e, f, b. So that's this surface on the bottom. And of course, uh, since that's on the bottom side, that vector will be pointing down. So again, that gives us a negative dx dy az. Uh, z is equal to zero. Plug that in. So now we have just the az terms that contribute. But you can see here, after we put z equals zero, there is no uh, z component at this point in the field. There may be some out here in the in this region here, but at this in this region. Uh, this is telling us there's no contribution there. So it's all zero, so everything falls out there. And of course, the final surface, uh, DHGC. So DHGC, that's what's on top here. Of course, that vector will be pointing up, so that'll be positive. Uh, with z equal to 1, plug that in. This time we do have uh, something at the AZ component. So we dot the AZs, and that's what we get. The AX and AY go to zero. Uh, integrate that out and then uh, when, when we get that integrated that comes to 2. So now we've integrated all six sides so now the final thing we need to do is just add up the total so we put in all our totals here and uh, when we add them up we get 0. So this is not uncommon. Uh, this just means that there is nothing inside the box that's contributing to the field. So all the fields being created by something outside the box, so everything going in and coming out is, is equal.